Till now we have talked about applying Gauss law to insulators. In this video, let us take a look at applying Gauss law to conductors. Now we said that conductors are materials in which electrons are not tightly bound to any atom. And so the way it happens is that there are these electrons which are moving about pretty freely in the conductor and we said that this is also called sometimes as an electron fluid. But this poses a problem when we try to apply Gauss law to the conductor because it is very difficult to tell what is the charge enclosed in any Gaussian surface because this electron fluid is always moving around and the charge enclosed by a closed Gaussian surface is, is always going to change. And so to apply Gauss law to the conductors, we have to impose an additional requirement on the conductor and that requirement is that the Gauss law can be applied on a conductor in which the net motion of charge is zero. And by net motion of charge, what I mean is not that the electron is not moving at all, but what that means is that if four electrons are moving in this direction, then at the same time four electrons are moving in that direction. And so what happens is that the net charge does not change. So the electrons uh, can have random motion or Brownian motion, but there is no directed motion of electrons which is going to cause a net change in the charge. And when you have this net motion of charge as zero, such conductors are said to be in electrostatic equilibrium. We said that Gauss law can be applied to these conductors only, but when a conductor is in an electrostatic equilibrium, there are four more interesting properties that apply to these conductors and those properties make applying Gauss law even more easier for conductors. And let us see what those properties are. So the properties of conductor in electrostatic equilibrium are as follows. First property is that if you have a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium, the electric field inside the conductor is zero. So is zero. The second property, let us note down all the properties and then we will try to understand them better. The second property is that if I have an isolated conductor and by an isolated conductor, what I mean is that it is not conduct, uh, connected to any other conductor, to a source of charge or to the ground with a conducting wire. So if I have an isolated conductor with some charge, then the entire charge resides on surface only. So the charge resides on surface of the conductor. The third property is that the electric field just outside the conductor is perpendicular. So electric field outside the conductor is perpendicular to the surface of the conductor and the value, the magnitude of electric field is given by sigma over epsilon zero where sigma is the charge density at that point on the surface. And the fourth property is that if I have some conductor which is irregularly shaped, which is not geometrically symmetric, then what I can say is that the surface density of charge is highest or is higher when radius of curvature of surface is lower or in other words it is inversely proportional to the radius of curvature of surface at that point. In the rest of the lecture what we will do is we will derive logically properties 1, 2 and 3 and for property 4 we will say that it is an experimentally observed fact and we'll just understand what that is trying to say. Okay, so let us start with deriving property number one. To do that, let us assume that I have a conductor and I am drawing this a pretty big conductor and I have placed this conductor in a uniform electric field as shown. Now the moment I draw an electric field like this, what that means is that the positive charge is here and the negative charge is here because electric field lines start from a positive charge and go towards a negative charge. So what happens when I place a conductor 
in an electric field like that. This semiconductor is not yet in electrostatic equilibrium. It has an electron fluid. So what automatically happens is that electrons start getting attracted towards the positive end. And so if I have an electron, it will move in this direction. So in general, electrons start moving in this direction. What that gives rise to is a net negative charge here. So I end up with a net negative charge here and as since the electrons move away, we get a positive charge here. The moment this happens, what is happening is that we are setting up an electric field inside the conductor, which is countering the electric field outside the conductor. And the electrons will keep moving. So right now, while the electrons are moving, my E outside is greater than E inside. But the electrons will keep moving till my E outside becomes equal to the countering electric field. And at that point, what is happening is that this field and this field are equal and opposite. And so my electrons stop moving because there is no net electric field. And so at that point, my conductor reaches electrostatic equilibrium. And what I can say is from this discussion, we know that if you want the electrons to stop moving, that is, if you want the conductors to be in electrostatic equilibrium, the only way that can happen is when the E out is equal to E in. And at that point, the net field E net inside the conductor is essentially E out minus E in, which is zero. And that proves my point number one, which says that electric field inside a conductor is always zero. Let us look at what the point number two says. Property two says that if I have an isolated conductor with some charge, that charge will reside only on the surface of the conductor. It does not reside inside the conductor. And let's see how we come to that. So I will pick some conductor. Remember, this is a 3D surface. I will consider a Gaussian surface which is very close to the inner surface of my conductor. This is a Gaussian surface. Let us apply Gauss law to the surface and what we get is integral E dot dA is equal to Qn closed over epsilon. However, we just discussed in the part 1 and this was my part 1 and this is my part 2. We just discussed in part 1 that E anywhere inside this conductor is 0 when the conductor is in electrostatic equilibrium. So, the surface integral of E over this surface, which is inside my conductor, is also going to be 0. And my flux is thus 0, and I get that this is 0. What that tells is that the charge enclosed inside the conductor is 0. However, we did say that the conductor had some net charge on it. And so, if the charge enclosed inside the conductor is 0, that obviously implies that all Q lies on the surface only of the conductor. So that proves my point 2 and I will tick mark that off. For the point 3, let us also again consider a conductor this time, but let us consider the Gaussian surface to be of a little different magnitude. Let me assume that my Gaussian surface is cylindrical and it is like something like this. Half of it is outside the conductor and the red rest half of it is inside my conductor. And remember this conductor is again some 3D object. Now let us see and how we can apply Gauss law over this surface. So what I have is integral E dot dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon zero. And I am trying to prove my part three. To begin with, let us have some discussion about the direction of E. Just for argument's sake, let me assume that if this is the surface, let me assume that E acts at some angle to the surface. It is not perpendicular, it is not parallel. E acts at some angle theta to the surface. The moment E acts at some angle to the surface, I can componentize E into 
a vertical and a horizontal component. What this implies is that there is some horizontal component along the surface of the, of the conductor. Now we just said that all the charge lies on the surface of the conductor. There is a horizontal component of E along the surface of the conductor and so what that means is that the charge should experience some motion due to this E. However, in a conductor mostly the charge carriers are negative that is electrons and so the electrons must experience a force in the opposite direction. However, if the electrons move then we are violating our principle of electrostatic equilibrium and so what that tells us that if the conductor is to be in electrostatic equilibrium then there can be no parallel component of E along the surface of the gun of E along the surface of my conductor and what that implies that E is only perpendicular to the surface of the conductor all right so that proved the part one for part two let us look at how we can apply the Gauss law here so E we said could only be perpendicular to the surface of the conductor we also said that E inside the conductor was zero and so if I apply Gauss law my E dot dA is essentially my three surfaces this is my outer surface which is I'm talking about this surface plus integral E dot dA of the curved surface plus integral E dot dA of the inner surface. Since electric field inside is zero according to what we discussed here this value goes to zero. Electric field is parallel to the curved surface essentially what that means is that my dA for the curved surface is like this and dA and E are perpendicular and so this part 2 is also 0. Here dA and E are parallel and so integral E dot dA essentially becomes E times A where A is the area of the surface. Let us see what is Q enclosed. So this is Q enclosed over epsilon 0. If the surface density of charge over this surface, that is my Q enclosed, this is the Q enclosed, because remember the charge resides only on the surface of the conductor. It is not inside the inside the conductor. It is not outside the conductor, obviously. And so the only charge that is enclosed by this Gaussian surface is the charge that resides on the surface, which is enclosed by the Gaussian surface. So if my charge density is sigma, then the total charge enclosed is sigma times A over epsilon 0. And so I have E times A is equal to sigma A over epsilon 0 and that gives me E is equal to sigma over epsilon 0. And so we have proved that E can only be perpendicular to the surface if the conductor has to be in electrostatic equilibrium and its magnitude is given by sigma over epsilon 0. So these three were logical proofs. For the fourth one, we will not present a logical proof. We will just say that we accept that this fact has been experimentally proven. But let us see what it means. What it means is that if I have an irregularly shaped conductor, say something like this, then the charge density over the surface of the conductor is inversely proportional to the radius of curvature of the surface. So the radius of curvature of this surface is really small as compared to say the radius of curvature of this surface. The radius of curvature of this surface is something like this whereas this is really small. And so what this property says is that the charge density over this surface will be much higher compared to the charge density over this surface. And that applies for any conductor that is in electrostatic equilibrium. How to apply Gauss law on this? We will look at a couple of examples in the coming video.